Go ahead and call the meeting of the uh, June 3rd, 2021 Capital Funding Protection Committee meeting to order at uh, 423. Uh, can I go ahead and have a roll call? Let's see. Devin Reese? Here. Oscar Delgado is absent. Charlene Bybee? Here. Paul Anderson? He is absent. Bob Lucy is absent. Gene Herman, absent. Justin Ivory? Here. Andrew Dis? Here. Elise Bonkowski? Here. Sophia Cardinal is absent. And Dave Solero? Here. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next item is 1.03 public comment. I do want to put on the record uh, that although we're starting late, uh, no members of the public had shown up and left in this means in this time pe period between 4 and uh, 4.23. So is there any public comment that we have on general? I have public no public comment. comment. All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item 1.04, action to adopt the agenda. Open. Got a motion and a second. Seeing no public comment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Item passes unanimously. Uh, with that, we'll move on to section two, uh, item 2.01, approval of the minutes for the April 14th, 2021 Capital Funding Protection Committee meeting. I move to approve the minutes of the April 14th, 2021 Capital second. Funding Protection Committee meeting as presented. Second. I've got a motion, a second, not seeing any public comment, so uh, call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Got a we time do have out. one public comment that came in by email. For, go ahead for and forward that to you. For item 2.01? For general. For ge okay, general. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to item 2.02, .02, information and discussion on the 2021 Nevada Legislative Session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Anderson and Mr. Searcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Lindsay Anderson on behalf of the Washoe County School District. Thanks for having me. I used to come to these meetings a lot more kind of in the early days. I remember uh, the very early days, but you've been doing your business without me, but it's nice to be here and see you. Uh, I just have a couple of bills I wanted to cover uh, with this committee, but I'm happy to talk about uh, anything else that I may leave out. It's fresh in my mind right now, so don't be shy. Uh, I've got the bill numbers. Uh, just quickly, uh, bills related specifically to school construction uh, i will say i think we were um, all excited and relieved to see the construction manager at risk sunset removed uh, in fact in two different bills uh, so we will now have the construction manager at risk uh, possibility for our projects going forward uh, into infinity until it's changed and we've had this kind of sunset being held over public entities for a number of years now and so i think uh, seeing that language deleted uh, is a relief uh, and something that we certainly supported am i too close uh, all so that was in both uh senate bill 141 and also assembly bill 410. Uh, assembly bill 410 also included some language uh, related to um I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the wrong word so Adam can correct me because uh, this is not my normal nomenclature, but uh, construction managers as agents uh, not being able to um, bid on work if they had been an agent in the four years preceding the date of the uh, proposal. Uh, so that's something I think our team has taken into consideration as we move forward. Um, and then uh, Assembly Bill 257 is a piece of legislation that was brought forward uh, dealing specifically with air ventilation systems and air quality in schools. So there is some language in this legislation that says uh, if money is available, and then a definition of if money is available that includes if we receive a federal appropriation or state or other appropriation specifically for the purpose of air quality, uh, that we will uh, perform these uh, air quality measures in the way that's outlined in the legislation. It's, it's complex, uh, and so I'm not going to try to explain what the process is to you. Um, I have the bill. I'm sure Adam could talk a little bit more about what it may mean. But it's a short-term piece of legislation. It expires in 2023. Uh, so if we do not do it between now and then, or if we do not receive funds specifically for that purpose, it will expire by limitation and will no longer be a uh, proposal that we have to take into consideration. Uh, so that is something I think that is on our radar over the next two years to see uh, what the air quality 
uh, projects look like as part of our district. And then uh, I'll finish with two things. One, I think, at least for me, uh, this is my fifth session representing the school district. It's the first one I can think of where we uh, did not make a change to prevailing wage, uh, particularly as it relates to school districts. Uh, and so I think that was uh, a relief. Uh, we also didn't see legislation uh, related to us around construction defect and things like that. So sometimes the absence of legislation is a statement in itself. Uh, but I will leave um, with what I would consider um, you know, a lot of things happen in this legislative session as it relates to education. I think I am the most excited and the most proud of Senate Bill 450, which is a 10-year extension of the rollover bond provisions as it relates to school districts. And it's particularly important to me because uh, be when I came to this school district, uh, we sat around a table and said, we don't have access to any school construction funds. Uh, and that was a dark time for our district. And we have come so far. Uh, we saw this language in 2015, which extended the rollover bond to 2025. And then we see Senate Bill 450, which extends it to 2035. Um, just for context, my son is in kindergarten, uh, and he is the class of 2032. Uh, so we will have access to these funds for an entire cohort uh, of students, knowing that the property tax, access to this property tax revenue, and our WC1 proceeds as part of a complete school construction package uh, is incredibly rewarding. Uh, I think you all will have a lot of work to do as we continue to invest in our school buildings with the resources that our, our voters and taxpayers have made available to us. Uh, so uh, I will leave it on that high note. Uh, and again, I'm happy to answer questions about bills that maybe I didn't mention uh, or things specifically you'd like some follow up on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Anderson? Not seeing any. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, hope, hopefully you're going to take a vacation now. Yeah. Not quite. Huh? <laughs> All right. That'll take us to item 2.03, presentation and discussion on the anticipated cadence and workload uh, for future meetings of the Capital Funding Protection Committee. Uh, Mr. Searcy. Hi. Good afternoon. Adam Searcy, for the record, Chief of Facilities. This is an item that I uh, would like to just have as a standing informational item. Uh, meeting every other month at most. Sometimes it's hard to kind of keep the pulse of the committee and what is upcoming. So this is something we're going to continue to bring to the committee. Um, and I'll just run through this high level. This is all should have been a part of your attachments. Uh, this afternoon we're going to be considering a couple of uh, proposals, proposed programs for fiscal year 22. We'll get into those later, of course. Um, but just as a look ahead, August uh, of course, we'll have the ongoing uh, new fiscal year, if you will, the new committee year um, introductions, committee um, elections. I should note uh, Member Ivory and Member Bonkowski um, agreed to renew their memberships, and that was approved actually um, at the most recent school board meeting and hope to uh, renew Member Dis's membership uh, before that August meeting as well as his terms expiring um, at the end of June. Um, we're also going to be bringing back um, an update on the capital projects audit. You guys certainly recall that endeavor and there were several recommendations that we have been working hard to implement to improve our transparency and accountability. And we're going to come and proactively provide you with an update as to our um, incorporation of those recommendations. And then in August, we anticipate bringing you really the first significant um, update on the progress towards the Debbie Smith CTE uh, project. That's rapidly underway in design right now. And by August, meaning we anticipate having visuals and some preliminary budget information to present you with. And then going forward, that project is going to take a prominent role in the work of this committee as we go throughout the rest of 2021. Um, in October, uh, it will feature prominently, but still for information, we'll um, hope to receive input from the committee and, court and uh, advise you of any developments and really work together with you and the entire community and design team as that project really begins to come into focus. Of course, after the start of the school year, we anticipate having uh, much more clarity on enrollment numbers and growth forecasts that have been 
thrown askew throughout this past school year and pandemic. So we'll likely come with just an informational item around um, enrollment and, and uh, student growth and capacity issues that we see uh, coming into focus this fall. And then I've got um, possible action on Rio Wrangler Area Elementary School, both um, at the October and December meeting. Um, that is to say that um, it may uh, be on either meeting agenda, and it will ultimately be dictated by that enrollment and growth demand uh, actual numbers this fall. So when we uh, assess the need this fall, uh, we may be coming to you to for construction phase funding for action this fall. You may recall we this committee had previously approved the design phase funding for that project. Um, we've completed that design and it is sitting ready to go out to bid should it be um, recommended as growth and overcrowding may dictate. But we'll be discussing that uh, likely this fall in some form or fashion. Closing out the year, we have historically an annual evaluation report as required by the policy governing this committee. So those are sort of annual items. And then either at the December meeting or possibly into the February meeting, um, we anticipate being at a place where we would be recommending construction phase funding budget, possibly for action on Debbie Smith CTE. Of course, as you know, that's projecting to begin construction summer 2022. And so that would allow us to put the scope of work out to bid in late winter, early spring, and be pr fully prepared to engage in construction as soon as school's out next summer. So that's kind of the look ahead. Um, nothing on the radar beyond that at this time. Um, but again, this is really just intended to be an informational item to kind of keep everybody attuned with uh, what we see coming forward um, and we'll keep you posted as this develops. So, any questions or discussion? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Any questions for Mr. Searcy on this file? Seeing none, go ahead and move on to item uh, 2.04, presentation and update on the fiscal year 2022-2026 five-year CIP. Mr. Searcy. Okay, thank you. There's uh, no visual aid for this one. This is regarding the five-year CIP that was presented and recommended uh, back in April. Um, we subsequently took that same recommendation to the Board of Trustees. However, in the interim, albeit brief, we received additional information from our design team on that Debbie Smith CTE project, indicating that the, the minimum project uh, construction phase budget um, would be in excess of what was originally proposed in the five-year CIP um, by a total of 15 million out of, I believe, 95 million. So uh, we had a discussion with council and our business office and uh, conferred with the chair and vice chair of this committee as to our intentions and our, uh, ultimately made the recommendation or the recommendation and received an amended motion from the board of trustees to approve the five-year CIP as recommended by this committee with the amended uh, the amendment to increase the funding in year two of that five-year CIP by the $15 million associated with the Debbie Smith CTE project. Because year one, F fiscal year 22, is what really goes into the actual budget and that years two through five are by nature uh, more dynamic and flexible. We felt we had the latitude to make that adjustment and recommended motion, but really what we're here to do today is just out of an abundance of transparency to ensure this committee and anyone observing this committee um, that we are communicating this fluidly that we did not take a recommendation and then modify it um, uh, when presenting it to the school board. So that's, that's really the update. Um, I know there's no visual aid for this. I've spoken to some of you about this. Uh, previously, as I mentioned, but again, out of an abundance of transparency, wanted to circle back and make that clarification on the record. All right, thank you. Are there any questions on that, Adam? No question. Sure. So, Adam, um, fifteen million dollar increase on that. What? What was this? Obviously, this is surprise. But what was the uh, main component, or was it across the board 
cost of so many things going up? Was it any one thing decision that on what's going to <coughs> go into that construction or into the school? I mean, 15 million is a pretty big jump and what, what would you account that? How would that be accounted for? Great question. I mean, the short answer is that it is fairly across the board. Um, you know, of course that campus is old and uh, riddled with uh, problem, structural problems and facility issues that are going to need to be remedied. Um, inevitably, when you get into a project like that, there's oftentimes what we call scope creep. You know, you get in there and you wanna do more and more and more since you're there. So we worked really hard to rein that back in. A couple of key items in addition to what I just kind of described. And I'm really, I, I'm looking forward to the August and October presentations because what they're working on is really spectacular. Uh, I, I think you'll be very impressed um, when the time is right. But um, there are a couple of, um, I wouldn't call them scope additions, but um, there's a portion of the building that is being uh, developed to relocate the board services aspect for the school district to that central campus, as well as our adult education or RISE program that's currently housed in a leased building um, in central Reno. We're looking to relocate and really has a complementary sort of adjacency on that campus. Those programs or th that square footage um, is arguably a scope addition to the original base scope of just the you know, uh, high school CTE program. So th those highlights in addition to just the complexity of the project coming into full focus. And of course, this is a, a CMAR project. So these budgets are being developed in partnership with the general contractor. So uh, we, we have a, a higher degree of confidence in their, their accuracy. So basically all of that put together uh, we felt that it was necessary to make that adjustment at this time rather than, you know, at the end of 2021 when it would be either too late to make that adjustment or too late to cut s that degree of scope to where we ended up with a project that really wouldn't meet the needs or the expectations um, of the project. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Searcy? Seeing none, let's go ahead and move on to item uh, 2.05, which is a presentation and discussion on the fiscal year 2022 information technology device refresh plan. I'm going to turn the driver's seat over to Dr. Chris Turner, our chief information officer for this presentation. Many of you may recall his presentation from our December meeting. Um, but here we have essentially the same scope back for action. Thanks, Adam. And as a refresher, and as he said, I'm Chris Turner, Chief Information Officer for Washoe County School District. And let's see. You warned me about this. So I'm here to discuss the sustainability portion of the Washoe County School District Strategic Technology Plan that was passed by the board in pieces, both in August and then in February. As Adam said, and as you may recall, this plan was first presented to the Capital Funding Protection Committee back on December 3rd. Uh, this same program will be presented at Tuesday's board meeting for their approval. Um, Another topic reminder is historically in the Washoe County School District, as we discussed back in December, refresh programs for technology uh, historically uh, have been both irregular, partial, and then they were ultimately discontinued because of those issues that were plaguing them. Uh, and then what we learned during the pandemic was how critically important technology plays a role in the ongoing education of our, both the teaching and learning that takes place in our classrooms. For the IT department, it, um, the pandemic also forced us into the development of 
And what we did was we internally developed a, a comprehensive in inventory tool. Um, this predates my acceptance of the position. We found that uh, in March, when the pandemic hit, we had no idea how many devices we had and where they might be located. So that tool has been developed and it continues to be developed as we try and target. We use our own IT tools to identify um, all the tool, all the computers that are in use in the district, but we're, we've sent out surveys so we can narrow down which are student devices and which are teacher devices so that we can be very particular when we come to not just judging a device on its age for its replacement, but also where it lives and who it's checked out to if it is checked out. Um, and then through a combination of general fund responses over the pandemic and the tireless work of our Education Alliance friends, as you see in the photos, um, the pandemic allowed for us to, to be in receipt of 17,000 new devices uh, since last July 1st. So we're very pleased with everybody's partnership, but school districts can't rely on the generosity of the community and the volunteer efforts. So that's what brings us here to this process. So speaking about the, the first issue is uh, equity amongst our schools. Um, we have some 97,000 devices, desktop computers, laptops, tablets, and even Chromebooks in use across the district. Some of these devices are no longer officially supported like Chromebooks because we selected to not be a Google district, but Chromebooks were purchased as recently as 2018. And so they're not, and because we're not a Google district officially, we don't support them. Um, and of those 97,000 plus devices, 26, nearly 27,000, 26,845 devices were purchased prior to 2017. So nearly one quarter of our devices are five years old or older. We have 491 computers that were purchased as far ago as 2013. So, um, in terms of inventory, in terms of the school inventory, we have um, what I perceive as schools that have uh, budgetary opportunities and schools that do not. And we're pretty evenly divided that way. We have 45 Title I schools that receive extra federal funding, and we also have five capital project schools that received uh, brand new devices when they were opened in the last couple of years. Then we have, so that make, gives us a total of 50 schools. Then we have 52 schools that are not, neither capital funded, brand new schools, nor um, Title I schools. So they're in a, a sort of a budgetary abyss. They don't have the opportunities uh, the, of the federal funding to get themselves more devices. So what they have to do, what they're forced to do, is to refresh their computer inventory using their own internal funding, which is limited. Um, and then. In terms of equity, we also are seeking some consistency. Uh, a, consistent, a consistent central source of funding with vendors who we recognize and who, who we're familiar with and all on a predictable annual timeline will make school operations much more efficient. And we can see, and what we're hopeful of seeing is when we enact this annual refresh process that it will have cascading effects down to the teaching and learning in the classrooms. We see advantages for central purchasing um, by leveraging our economies of scale. What we're proposing is with the funding that we're being uh, allotted is we anticipate the purchase of about 10,000 devices per year. Um, and, I'll, and I'll get down into the details of how those devices break down. But certainly you can recognize that purchasing 10,000 devices at once has cost advantages over a school individually purchasing 20 or 50 devices this year or the next year. So we see big cost advantages. We also see, uh, I use this word a lot, coherence, because we're moving away from uh, non-standard devices, off-brand devices. We're, we'll get to a place where we'll, use, we'll purchase devices with which we're familiar, that are, that are repairable and supportable. Uh, and then perhaps most importantly is that, that, uh, that bulleted point, school relief. Um, we see this centralized process as providing relief for school principals from the planning, the budgeting, 
in the purchasing of devices year over year. This frees them up to perform the, the job that we've asked for them to do as being the principal educator of the building, principal teacher, and, um, and we're hopeful that that frees them up appropriately. And then now, down at the bottom, the final point is um, there's parallels to the process that we're proposing in the, in the infrastructure refresh process. Um, we're, we're proposing a five-year renewal plan, but there's other, besides the infrastructure refresh process, there's other parallel applications uh, at work in the district where we're annually examining roofs and HVAC systems and parking lots using capital funds for the refresh of those installations as well. So more to the details of the annual refresh process. Where, um, the, the budget process has revealed that this year there's four and a half million dollars being appropriated for the process. It's included as part of the five-year CIP. Um, what we're proposing, as you can see there, is we would refresh, five years breaks up into 20% per year, we would refresh 20% of the teacher laptops year over year, targeting the oldest first. So first in, first out, right? So the oldest ones would be replaced by these new ones, and then we would go through five years and start all over again. Those, those principals that got new devices first would get devices again in the sixth year. The student piece is a little bit more complex. Um, it's obviously if 20% of our teachers is about 700 or so teachers, that's not as big of uh, a financial uh, commitment as the student devices. Uh, that equals out to between 9,500 and 10,000 devices per year. So this is where we are probably going to require some flexibility, and I'll talk about the flexibility in a moment. But where our goal is, and this is aspirational, we think the numbers work out, but I don't mind setting high goals for ourselves. We're going to take, so since we're no longer necessarily a one-to-one -one district that was determined at the, uh, at the August and the February board meetings. We are what we're defining ourselves as technology rich. So we'll look at a school's enrollment and we'll multiply that times a factor of 80%. So instead of one device per kid, we'll have eight devices for every 10 students. That's our goal. And we're hoping to renew 20% of that 80% per year for five years and then start the process over again. Um, this process will only involve, uh, importantly, that bottom point, it will only involve personal technology, not installed classroom technology like the boards that we're using here or sound fields that we're using here, only laptops and tablets. Some more details. Um, these figures were just uh, arrived at this, this weekend when I looked at the tools available to me. We have, uh, according to uh, the most recent analysis, we have 3,840 teachers. You multiply that times 20%, that's 760 laptops that we will refresh this summer for our teaching staff next year. We've estimated costs of a teacher laptop, which would have a larger screen, more storage. They have extra features compared to a student laptop. We estimate that that laptop to cost $650. So doing that math, it equals about a half a million dollar expenditure. Now the students, uh, as of May 31st, when I looked at our Washoe County data, it indicated 61,599 students enrolled. Um, and then you multiply that times 80%, then times 20%, and we arrive at 9,856 laptops to be renewed at an average cost, an estimated cost of $400 for the annual expenditure for this year to be nearly $4 million. So $4 million plus 500000 equals very close to the $4.5 million that has been allotted to us this year. Um, we think that well, I'll get into the details, but the, uh, those estimated costs, especially the, on the student device side, may fluctuate, and that's why we need some flexibility in terms of how many devices may end up becoming part of our acquisition process and the refresh process, because as you may know, and speaking to flexibility, anything with a chip now is uh, the, those supplies are constrained, as you may have recognized, and that extends 
across uh, markets and manufacturers. So um, there's there's a, people are having a hard time sourcing cars as well as computers. So anything with a chip uh, is requiring uh, tremendously long lead times, lead times that we haven't been accustomed to before. And we've had to change uh, devices midstream. In fact, the device I brought today, this wasn't originally what we bid out. We bid out an HP um, device, and they weren't a, they, uh, our, our um, distributor wasn't able to source it in, in our time frame, so we switched and we got 10,000 of these uh, Lenovo's and they've been working great. So we just, the flexibility needs to continue to be emphasized both on what device we end up with, the bids that come in, as well as the price. So we'll, we're, we're happy for the advantages that we can get when we purchase 10,000 devices at a time, but we also recognize the need that it might be a mix. It might be 5,000 of this and 5,000 of that. Um, so I've discussed the economic conditions, the chip shortages. Um, we also recognize that teachers and our student enrollment will vary year over year, and that will be, we won't work off the numbers from the previous year. We'll run this annually and analyze them. We'll get really granular in terms of how many staff each building has that we have to refresh for, at, at both uh, students and teachers. And then finally, as part of the annual budget process, um, we will work within the do not exceed figure that's provided to us from the business department. So we'll maximize the purchasing up to that number and of course won't exceed it. And that's all, that's all I have if there's any questions for me. All right, are there any questions? Member, Member Reese. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation. Can I just ask, um, so during the pandemic and given some of the resources that came to the City of Reno through the CARES Act, the City of Reno made a decision to allocate some of those funds to computer resources. How does that fit in with it? I, I can't remember. It was $3 million, I think, uh, to purchase laptops for kids to, to have at home. Yeah. Is that in here somewhere yeah and that's something that I failed to mention w one thing w one assumption that we're making is of course the reason that we s transitioned from a one-to-one -one identified district for our new capital buildings to a technology rich district as a whole is we'll, we'll be returning to face-to-face -face instruction and that that was passed at the last board meeting so we're excited about that um, the city of Reno did share uh, some of their I, I believe CARES Act monies with us and then it there was there was the city of Reno, but then there was specific departments that shared, like we got sixty thousand dollars from the Reno Housing Authority, so that we could purchase devices that serve their their com communities too. So we've been very fortunate to be in receipt of I don't know the exact number of what the the grant sharing was from uh, city of Reno, but it was considerable, and those monies went into the purchase of that you know populated that 17,000 devices that we've onboarded since last July. Can I ask a clarifying question maybe? Is it a fair characterization to say that that donation and similar ones went to acquire devices which are now a part of our asset inventory that we will be assessing for renewal um, across the district? Yeah, yeah that's so the 17,000 that we've acquired since July 1st of last year are part of that 97,000 overall total inventory that we that we know that we own. Um, school buildings are excited about the opportunities that those laptops provided for their teachers and students, and some of the principals are even emailing me asking me what to do with those laptops. And you know, we're of the opinion that we've given them, you know. We, we looked at our inventory tool, we recognized who had old inventory or depleted inventory, and we prioritized those schools, and we're telling those schools, you own those devices now, those are yours, and, and we won't have to renew those. It, it, pe pending the successful passage of this plan, we won't have to renew those devices for six years. Yes, sir. Uh, Justin Ivory for the record. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. So 
in, I think it was last meeting, uh, when this was brought in, I don't know if it was uh, informational or what it was, but we actually had this item as $4 million over the next five years, and now we're at 4.5, and then, not to jump too far ahead, but when we get into the infrastructure, district-wide infrastructure upgrades, um, spreadsheet that comes in later, it's actually 4.6. Um, I'm just trying to figure out why. I'll take a stab at that. Um, Adam Searcy, for the record, may be joined by our chief financial officer. Um, the second question first, the 4.6 that's a part of the next agenda item um, refers to IT infrastructure, and so that's your servers and other hardware components that are really a part of the building system, the Wi-Fi and other things that are more a physical component of the building. We have a annual refresh program on those assets, more akin to our roofs and our boilers and our flooring. That's why that is in that program. That is an IT element, but it is separate and distinct from what we're talking about here device-wise. I'm going to give a stab at the 4 versus 4.5 that you mentioned initially. You're correct, the last time that we uh, presented this for your information, um, it was estimated at 4 million. That was based on a preliminary forecast of available revenue sources, I believe, uh, Cell tower revenue, cell tower proceeds, and uh, property tax revenues in excess of debt service um, sources such as that, and that since then, those uh, revenue forecasts have uh, come into focus to be greater than expected at that time, and that's what accounts for the four point or the four to four point five difference. I'm gonna. Uh, let that get corrected. Mark's dying to it get here. It's not quite on the money. <laughs> so to clarify, the last board meeting, there are three components to this, the to funding of device replacement. And so we had estimated um, the uh, property tax monies above me on debt service to be anywhere from two to four million. So that's where you're remembering the four million. On top of that, the second funding source is interest earnings on the debt service fund, and that's what constitutes the extra 500000 And then the third funding component of the device replacement program is cell tower revenues, and that's roughly 200000 So in that last presentation, it was roughly as much as $4.75 million we had identified. So um, it's not the case that monies are coming in higher, although they did. That's not what we're doing here. Of the four and a half million, four million is the property tax revenues, and five hundred thousand is the interest earnings. Okay, because because I also, if, if I if I recall this correctly, uh, the question was asked about what these devices, what we were talking about buying IT devices, was this for the kids or was this for the kids and faculty? And I, I believe the answer was we were at the time we were just talking about just purchasing for the kids, and then I'm not sure that that, you know, I, I'm dead set on one or the other, but my follow-up question to that would be, if we're not a one-to-one -one district, we're an eight device per 10 kids, so is it going to be if the devices go up in price but the budget stays at the same amount in order to meet the eight to 10 for the kids, you would then reduce because there is no minimum for faculty devices? Is that the game plan here? Or? Yeah, so we saw the flexibility piece uh, as living in the in the larger expenditure with the student devices, and so we're. I think that's an excellent question. Um, we've always, uh, my recollection has been that we've always intended to try and refresh both teacher and student devices because there's a need in both for both of the audiences. Um, the teacher, the teacher numbers. Uh, we don't see as fluctuating as much, and it's a smaller number, so we feel like we, we can accomplish the refresh in a five-year process of 20% per year. We think there's, there's opportunities for wiggle room with the, uh, when we purchase like the 9,900 devices uh, at the student level. So 
we see those the wiggle room and those opportunities in spaces like at elementary school, we might be targeting um, the more expensive laptops for the grades three through five at an 80% level. And then grades K2, we would be, you, we would be uh, focusing on uh, tablets, which are slightly less expensive, sl slightly more affordable. And that way, we still reach our goal of 20% of 80% per year. OK, and then just one more question, because you, you started off the conversation with kind of a, what we had historically done. And historically, has the district always provided faculty with laptops? I know, I know historically we haven't provided students with laptops until the pandemic came about. But, and so that's kind of a brand new thing. So historically, can you give us some background on how we provided faculty with laptops or devices? and then where that funding source came from prior to today. Right, so thank you for the opportunity for clarifying. I guess what I was speaking about was historically, there's been no refresh pro um, program for students or teachers. Um, traditionally, what teacher, the, the ways that teachers acquired new teaching technology it for themselves uh, was through the allocation provided by their principal. So principals had to plan for the renewal of devices in their buildings year over year. And it, it, like I said in the presentation, it was irregular. And then, I mean, it's on, it, any central process was irregular. But, and I can't speak to necessarily the school history piece. But in my conversations with some of my colleagues that have a little bit more history here, uh, there was no central program. And it was left to the buildings for teachers to, or for principals to use their operating funds, their operating budgets, to buy, you know, a handful of devices this year and then repeat the process year over year in order to get their teachers refreshed. And then, okay, so historically, how has that worked? I mean, are, do we? I guess my question is, so is that still going to happen? Is is that money still going to go into that or are we taking because my concern here is we're going to be taking money from capital improvement and we're going to start buying laptops for faculty that used to be taken out of general fund which as we all know is just another way of saying we're going to take capital funding money and put in general fund because now the capital funding money that was going towards buying those laptops and those devices and stuff is now going to go towards something else is that, is that my understanding yeah let me before mark jumps on this let me just say that the you're right you re, you've recognized what the process that will occur but we also have technology issues um, refresh um, issues that are surfacing outside of just the personal devices that teachers and students use so I, I said that this program is limited to the personal technology that will be used by teachers and students um, but there is an ongoing need for sound field refresh and for the interactive boards. All of the installed technology that's in classrooms, you know, some of it is beginning to show its age and needs refreshing. Additionally, there's other areas w that relate to technology where some of those general funds that are being freed up in schools that won't be applied to the purchase of student and teacher laptops, uh, like laptop storage, so you know, a, a card or a furnishing that can handle the storage of those laptops. What what we're proposing is this step in order to take the burden away from the the school principal to refresh laptops year over year for students and teachers, and free them up to use their operating budgets in ways that also benefit their building, like interactive displays, sound fields, device storage, or other technology related issues now and, and uh, you can okay hopefully I covered it okay. Thank you. Nice. This. <clears throat> Thank you mr. chairman um, going back to the equipment for the kids since we're not a one-to-one -one district how do we make sure that we're not creating an equity gap can you paint a picture for me I mean, if we have a classroom full of 20 kids, that means four of them are not getting updated equipment that year. Just kind of walking through that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's less about being 
less, or it's less about not being a one-to-one -one district and more being about technology rich. And what those phrases mean is, so we, we recognize that technology won't be in use by every student every day, every moment every day. So there's, there's, there's not only students that will be in fine arts or performing arts or physical education that won't be using a laptop at a, at a moment, but there's also opportunities in every other class where people aren't using technology. Technology is not, um, you know, the, a student's use of a laptop won't be all day, every day. So the idea is, is we'll supply laptops to 80% of the school's enrollment, and that what, what the principal can do, this is a site-based decision, but what the principal can do is take, let's say, 30 laptops, place them in a cart, and then assign it to the social studies department for them to share throughout the day. So it won't be the case where you know, four kids or 10 kids are left out of computing opportunities during the day or during that particular class period. It's about um, making some, you know, creating a, um, an inventory of devices that are in use by an entire class instead of just partially. Do, do you see the difference instructionally how that might work out? Good. Member Bybee first. Come back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of things. First, I'm kind of stunned that principals were responsible for doing this out of their operating fund and that I thought with a school district and a whole IT department that that's where that would be happening. So I'm kind of, you threw me there that I didn't expect that to go down to whatever the principal had in an operating fund to decide, especially and obviously with pandemic, but even before that, uh, the technology needs are so critical. And I mean, my kids went to Mendive when it was brand new. And, uh, you know, when, when you saw technology at a brand new school way back then, how it was compared to the older schools at that time, but the technology used for kids, uh, which is even, you know, obviously much greater today than it was, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So I kind of was, that, that surprised me. Um, I think it makes sense it should be back into the IT department. You guys are the experts in that. But when we're saying refresh, are you taking devices that we have in our hands already and doing the upgrades necessary or and or purchasing if they need to be purchased? Is I mean, refresh for me is taking this device and, and upgrading it. But does refresh also include the purchase? And when you talked about some of the different, um, you know, you got a better deal than you did on the HP there. You also mentioned trying to get technology or devices that are the same so that repairs are easier. It's kind of like, I go back to my other career of airplanes. You know, Southwest Airplane Airlines flies one equipment. And so for repairs and parts and all of that, it makes it much more fiscally responsible to do that. So if you're doing, so I guess it's two questions. If you're doing other brands or other types of devices, um, can you still be repairing and utilizing it if you've got a multitude of different brands of devices. So I guess that would be two questions, um, if you could. Thank you. So in terms of the devices, we, we feel like we can be a lot more nimble of a department in trying to support as few manufacturers as possible. The other advantage of, of pursuing fewer manufacturers is the the pricing advantages and in some of the ancillary advantages associated with that so we're, we're hoping for longer warranties that are included and if we're if we can talk to the distributors and the manufacturers in terms of we will be purchasing this tremendous amount year over year um, what can you do for us in terms of price and all the all the ancillary um, uh, features that we that we are looking for, like the warranty that I talked about. So we think that's a that's a huge advantage for us. What was the other question? Oh, the refresh. So that that's just our phrase that we're using in terms of we will be buying new. This this process is twofold. We're we're looking to um, get rid of an e-waste those old devices that we're finding don't run the tools that we're using to conduct our classes. So we use, we use a, you know, an online collaboration tool. It stores a lot, it's our learning management system. 
and some of those devices that are five years old and older cannot we can't load our email program we can't load the, the Microsoft Office suite um, and those collaboration tools are not working too so we're looking forward to e-wasting those devices that are too old for our to, for our inventory and for our use and Mark is dying to get online here but so you can I, refresh so, the newer ones so so I think when we say refresh that largely means device replacement it means an older an older laptop being replaced with a newer laptop when it's at end of life okay so you're not looking to any of these devices that aren't that old being able to be upgraded or technically refreshed or with technology moving as fast as it is it's a replacement because it costs too much to usually to repair we'll be, costly. we'll be purchasing 20% okay. of 80% year over year okay. and we'll be getting we'll be e-wasting the older devices but the devices that are one two years old the devices that we just got in the last year the even devices three years old we're, we're going to continue to use them until their end of life as well as part of this process okay thank you for that clarification and, and just to go back to your first point yeah that was the sad case that principals had to raid their school operating budgets to pay for de uh, replacement devices, which is why you saw, you know, when you toured schools, devices that were 10, 15 years old. Yeah. Like at my house. <laughs> All right, number three. Okay, just just need another clarification that on the question came up. So, the laptops then don't go home with the students. That's a site-based decision. So one-to-one -one schools, ha ha that's a different academic and curricular delivery method than a technology-rich. Um, they Laptops are able to go home with students, but that's not, that's not the curricular goal that we're pursuing in the future. If there's an instance where uh, a class needs to use a laptop overnight because the teacher flipped the classroom and wants some of the instruction to take place at home, and then they um, and then they remediate the next day. Obviously, that's a site-based decision. If a student needs a device overnight because they don't have a device at home, that's a site-based decision. But yeah, we're not we're not precluding uh, the loan of devices for students overnight. It's just not our direct curricular goal moving forward. So I guess then, because in my mind, I'm thinking we're buying these devices because of what we just went through with the pandemic, where all of a sudden we have in home learning where we can't even provide teaching to a lot of students that can't afford a laptop or something like that. But what we've really done is we're, we're basically saying we're gonna provide laptops for in-class learning. So is this going to replace books? Is this going to, re wh why are we adding the laptop to, to in-class learning? I'm a little confused there. Yeah, so the the future curricular direction of the district is, is technology rich as I've identified and there's opportunities for what we call hybrid learning where teachers uh, have students participate in research or, or writing using the computer and, and we write across the curriculum whereas my earlier example identified students maybe not necessarily using a laptop in PE, there may be opportunities for uh, physical education teachers to assign research and writing projects for their classes. So the idea is that we have uh, technology as a supplemental tool that's used in a classroom in addition to a textbook and in, in addition to a notebook and, and, a, and a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, it's just another tool. Um, what we haven't had is uh, a central process for the refresh of, of devices in the district and this is just an opportunity now to seize the moment because we've recognized how important technology is to instruction and, and this is uh, this is our plan to address that and, and I don't mean to keep beating a dead horse here but didn't we learn how important IT is to our students because they weren't in the classroom though I mean, it seems to me like that—that that was my understanding anyway of laptops. Was it, it was it was an equity thing. Certain kids didn't have the ability to do it at home, but in the in the classroom, I'm not saying that we don't need some laptops in the classroom. I just don't know that we need eight out of ten kids to have a laptop in front of them throughout the day. 
So the the way that the a typical class day works out and a way a day works out in a school that's that's left up to the school and how a teacher conducts their classes but our, our vision of course is not for students to be on a laptop from from the beginning bell to the end bell and for all six or seven periods the, the idea is that it's available to them and it's available to teachers to use as a resource on a case-by-case -case basis or a moment-by-moment or instructional moment uh, basis. Um, so, correct, uh, students won't be using them all day, every day, but there are opportunities for us um, to engage students in a, in a collaborative online environment. It's, a, it's an opportunity for teachers to store documents online um, and, and students to participate in this sort of hybrid learning environment. Um, some of the details about how technology is used in the classroom is probably better for uh, left for uh, the academic department, uh, Chief Academic Officer Troy Parks. But I'm I'm happy to uh, continue to discuss it if you have additional questions. I, all I'm saying is it, it. I was I was under a different idea of what these laptops were doing. I thought these were laptops that went home with kids. They were going to be, and that's why we needed. 80% of the district. I just wonder to myself out loud if 20% of laptops for if we had just a flat 20% and re redid those and maybe got a better product if it wouldn't be a better solution and then you you know uh, like everything else if you want to schedule that you want uh, you know the gymnasium or the small gym or something for a classroom you schedule it if you want your your students to have laptops on Thursday. You schedule the, so you you know so you've got your 36 laptops in that classroom, or whatever. That's that's my two cents, I guess. All right. Uh, with that, don't see any more uh, discussion. I uh, would like to uh, move on to the next item, uh, if that's all right. So, Dr. Turner, thank you very much. Appreciate appreciate thank that information. Um, just uh, before Mr. Searcy jumps up here, I wanted to, uh, you know, we've all been provided this information, and we've had it for a while. Uh, hopefully you could uh, give us the highlights of this uh, because we potentially do have a, a, a quorum issue coming up fairly soon, so I'd like to get to the action item uh, if we could. So I'd appreciate, uh, appreciate that. Thanks, sir. Sorry, just so I'm clear, are you looking for an overview of item 2.06 or are we reshuffling the item? Sorry, no, I think it's important to get the overview of item 2.06 before moving into item 2.07, which is the action item for 05 and 06. So if we can get the, the, uh, the highlights, the, the, the meaty information on this, I uh, appreciate that. Thank okay. you for having me this evening. I'm Tammy Zimmerman, Deputy Chief Facilities Management Officer, um, here to present the FY22 Capital Renewal Plan. And just to give you a status update, this is our the status of our 2021 Capital Renewal Plan. We bid 108 projects that total over $20 million in construction costs so far. So even with the pandemic, we've really been cruising along. So. Our capital renewal process, um, we start with our facilities condition index using our in, uh, environmental safety and assessment office. They do an inspection of our facilities yearly. Um, we also use our uh, maintenance shop supervisors and our SFCs at the sites because they're the boots on the grounds that know deficiencies and see those every day. Um, we also go to the Safe and Healthy Schools Commission and use them for our safety um, items as well. But we take all of that information, we meet with them, we talk about them, we go through the process, and then it takes about three months and we come up with a list that you will see as attachments to this. So I um, want to talk really quickly about each of the items. We have ADA on here. You'll notice that one of them is a deficiency from, based from the Nevada Department of Education. They come in and assess our career technical and education programs for accessibility to our students. And they highlighted AACT this year and notice that there were some sinks that needed to have some ADA access for wheelchair accessibility. So we go through those. We always have an ADA item on here because we always want to make sure that our schools are getting and reaching that ADA and accessibility for all of our students. Um, we do have older buildings, so that's we work towards that continually. 
Um, our asbestos and lead, we're painting our exterior of the Wooster um, early childhood because it is lead, it is a potential hazard to them, and so we prioritize that as a high priority item that needs to be taken care of. This item here is the carpentry list. Carpentry consists of roofing, um, painting, masonry sealing, replacement of gym dividers, um, locksmith, as well as flooring. I um, want to talk about a little bit quickly about the uh, Veterans Elementary Phase 2 of the Seismic Retrofit. That came about with a study that is in accordance with the FEMA um, safety hazards for um, earthquake hazards. And so we did a study with that. A veterans was one of the schools. That project encompasses taking the roof off, the electrical conduit, and the HVAC units to get to the underneath to actually structurally retrofit that. So it is, you can see the dollar amount there. It is um, three and a half million, but there's a lot of pieces that have to be taken off and we may as well replace them while we're at it since those units are over 20 years old. The other item I want to highlight on here are the clinical floor replacements. Washoe County Health Department does a uh, inspection of our facilities yearly. They have asked, because we have carpet in some of our clinics, to replace those with a hard surface. That carpet is, we can sanitize it, but it just makes sense to replace them. So we're going to put a hard surface in there to make that easier. Next slide. Educational options. This item is, has been on the capital renewal, but it's a more inclusive process this go around, we go out and ask departments of their needs, as well as schools. And you'll see on there that North Valley's High School has a CTE classroom upgrade. That is their cybersecurity upgrade that they're asking to do. They're having a lot of interest for that. And we're actually looking at subdividing a larger classroom and then putting in additional drops to facilitate that curriculum for them. Electronics, that's our life safety with electronics, fire alarms. Um, and, and speakers in our public address system into classrooms or r facilities and rooms that we have staff and students in because that's a safety issue, notifying them of a code so that they know how to react to that. The next item is the energy items. Those you'll see on an attachment, but those are items that we use to replace small pieces in our building systems to make them run more efficient, efficiently so that we can save funds doing that. We also have a retrofit commissioning on there, and that's kind of a tune-up to those systems to make sure that they're running in the paces that they're supposed to be running, because if they're running like they're supposed to, that saves us money. Our grounds items, those are our, our typical irrigation and playground equipment, replacing them because we can't find parts for the playground equipment. We have hazards on them, so that's what those items are about. IT infrastructure, we talked about a little earlier. It is the hard bolted down pieces in the infrastructure, servers, switches, battery backups, all of those items. Next slide. This is our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, or MEP as it's known in the trades. It encompasses our HVAC retrofits and replacements with controllers so that we can talk to them and schedule them. Um, it also has our electrical components of switch gear. It also has fire sprinklers, um, is isolation valves, sewer replacements, drinking fountain replacements, but really the one I wanted to highlight was Reed High School. Um, we have 23 units up there that seem, we started seeing it this last year where they were starting to go down, costing us a lot of money to actually replace parts. So we are proposing to replace 23 of them so that we can get that whole school back up and running um, and not spend our maintenance money doing that when it's, we're just replacing parts and they really need to be replaced as a whole. The next item is our facility utilization. That used to be called overcrowding. Um, since we have gotten past some of our pent up overcrowding, we decided to relabel this. It'll be used to decommission portables that may not be used, they need to be used, especially the ones that don't have restrooms in them, um, and remodel classrooms, maybe interior to our existing schools. But it could be used for you know, any overcrowding we might see in spot areas. Paving is, is done by a third party and that's extending our useful life or replacing it. Um, we really need to spend quite a bit in there. If you've seen some of our parking lots, they, they desperately need it, but it's got track repairs, tennis courts. Um, and then our next, our next category is safety and security. We have the boiler and chiller safety code upgrades. That's due to the, the issue that they had at UNR. So we wanna diligently work on that to put shutoffs in where we have fuel being used in those areas. Um, we have 
bi-directional antenna upgrades. That's so that we can actually get to the 700 megahertz in the county and use that system across all of our, our BDAs. And then we have single point of entry retrofits, which is our older schools that may not have some of the glazing and the upgrades that our newer schools have. Um, we felt that that was important. Under 50 is just our under $50,000 projects that are small enough. If I gave you the list, you'd, you'd have several sheets of paper with it. So um, we just use those to get those small projects that are, that are in need. There's program contingency, construction management, and program administration. Those have been on the, the renewal in years past. Um, but this year, we're doing $40 million in renewal. We have increased that. Um, last year, we were a little conservative just due to the pandemic, and so we're going to increase it. But those categories have increased. Um, the shape of the pie, the, the percentage of the pie is about the same for each of those categories, but the pie has just gotten larger. And that is our capital renewal and a quick glance. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <laughs> Are there, uh, there any questions for Ms. Zimmer? Let's start with uh, Member Dis. Ms. Zimmerman, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Mr. Dis? So I got I got a question about a school that we know very well. So McQueen, um, I, my parents live up in Northwest Reno. Every Sunday when I go for dinner, I drive past those portables that Mr. Sutton, when he was at the school district, used to put on all the flyers as case in point of why we need WC1 money. And when I look at some of the upcoming expenses, you know, I'm looking at North Valleys, at Smith Ridge. Um, we got costs for roofing on some of those portable units. Um, when are we going to address the issue of even having kids in portable units and, and getting them in an actual brick and mortar classroom? I'll take a stab at that if I could. Um, as we continue to build additional capacity, especially particularly at the high school level, um, we see overcrowding relief um, really domino or cascade across the district. Um, there are definitely conversations on all of our high school capacities, including McQueen. Most likely, the impacts associated with the Debbie Smith CTE Academy, which will be an open enrollment type of uh, uh, zoning, if you will, um, we'll see a significant percentage, possibly in the hundreds of students who are zoned for McQueen and would otherwise attend McQueen, for example. Uh, choose to enroll in Debbie Smith. So really the plan at this time is, is to determine the impacts of the opening of the new Proctor Hug High School and the new Debbie Smith CTE Academy, assess the need at that time specific to McQueen, and then absolutely we have conducted or completed a conceptual study for expansion and renovation of McQueen specifically um, that would result in the elimination of those portables entirely in, in a modernization of that facility but before we can act on that we really need to know you know how many students actually are going to continue to be enrolled in McQueen and we won't know that until likely 2023. McQueen's just one example but you know there's portables all over the district and I, I think I believe Smithridge is, is an elementary school so it's it's affecting smaller schools as well and I'm, I'm just concerned about you know that there is a difference between Taking a class in the portable and then in the in the brick and mortar, like I said. So just want to make sure that that is high on the priority for you guys to address. Two brief extensions to that explanation. The uh, facility utilization item you saw here will absolutely be used annually to continue to whittle away at that scenario you described, which you're correct is widespread across our district. And then you may recall mention of the core school investments in the five-year CIP. That is absolutely going to be developed in detail and likely expanded as we know more about our growth and enrollment levels um, to address those types of issues all across the district. All right, Member Ivory. Uh, for the record, Justin Ivory. A uh, couple of quick questions. Uh, the HVAC upgrades that we'll be doing in this next year, are we going to be incorporating the new guidelines for this legislation that just passed so that we would be eligible to possibly receive federal money to reimburse our uh, account for stuff that we had already done, perhaps? 
that was a, a discussion, a topic of discussion for us, and we'll have to see what those rules and regulations are to see how they apply to us. But we would definitely look to those if they are there and meet our needs to, in order to do that and reimburse us. Perfect. That's what I wanted to hear. And then on the portables, um, I've got to imagine that they're probably the largest cost in removing a portable is the dump fee, or I, I don't even know what you do with the portable. The largest cost is actually seeing if you can get somebody to take it, right? Nobody wants them. It is it is a demo for all you know for all intents and purposes. It's, we don't reuse them. We've tried to repurpose them to other districts that may need them if they want them. Um, other charter schools, um, we have other people who've asked for them, but they also don't have the funds to move them because it's not cheap. So I guess that brings me to my next question. Have we talked to the cities about, I know they're constantly trying, you know, we just built this structure down here on 4th Street. Have we talked to the cities about uh, I, I, I only because I happen to drive by the one over on North Edison the other day where they've torn where used to, it's all floodplain zone now. If, I mean, is it more feasible to set these things up for a temporary amount of time and then let maybe this, you know, the city doesn't have to pay for them, but maybe the city takes care of the final disposal of it, I guess. We would always look to to give those to a municipality if we could, um, if they're willing to take them and them and install them. Absolutely. Well, I guess what I'm saying is we've we've got to pay for the demolition cost anyway. We could probably swing a deal where we would move it and set it up for them, put the stairs and ramp out in front and everything. They could use the facility, and then kind of like a street, it becomes theirs. Well, I'm not going to obligate the city of Reno to anything, but I, I don't know that the uh, the two portables at McQueen, since my three children have gone there, are probably not worth saving. So I, I don't think that we're going to take uh, those, but uh, always open to the discussion. Obviously, as an environmental steward of the resources we have, we want to be purposeful with them. So uh, if you wish to speak to me offline about it with our city in particular, happy to facilitate conversation, just probably not the two from McQueen. <laughs> I remember, I remember well, and I would, I would agree with uh, Councilman Reese. Uh, we are all looking for solutions and kind of one of my top priorities is affordable housing, is our housing uh, dilemma and looking at innovative solutions. The village at State Street is a perfect example and that was the camp that came down, the mining camp, and uh, that's been a tremendously successful, uh, the Tony Homes, Hope Springs. Um, I, I mean, there's other, there's other things. There's 3D housing. I mean, there's actually housing they make 3D uh, in other communities, and, those, um, and, and the units that we had uh, set up for the overflow during the pandemic, they're on Edison. Um, you know, that company, Atco, uh, is using those actually moved out of town and they're using them for homeless, you know, for homeless in other communities. So those big trailers, which I think are not quite the same uh, as what we have, but uh, certainly, you know, solutions I think uh, I would <coughs> be looking at and as an alternate to the Community Homeless Advisory Board and working with Reno Housing Authority, you know, there are th all of us are at the table looking for anything that's innovative and uh, uh, possible help with uh, with our housing and with the homeless in this community. So yes, I would be open to exploring. All right, are there any more questions on this item 2.06? Seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. And with that, we'll move on to item 2.07, uh, which is the uh, presentation discussion and possible action uh, on the major projects program. Mr. Searcy. A lot of information on this sheet uh, should look very, very familiar to you for a reason. Um, the updated information largely is found in the gold column on the right. This is updated as of May 17th, 2021, reflecting the dollars we have actually committed towards these projects versus the purple column, the dollars that this committee and the school board have allocated towards these projects. Historically, projects that have been on the original 
list of projects associated with WC1. Asterisked are projects added since 2016. We added a new line item associated with the technology device refresh program up here next to the capital renewal program um, in the hopes that this does become basically an annual uh, part of our facility renewal overall. So you can see the proposal here, uh, 40 million as we just discussed for capital renewal and 4.5 million for fiscal year 22 technology device refresh program for a total recommended um, allocation recommendation of 44.5 million. All right, thank you, Mr. Searcy. Are there any questions for Mr. Searcy? Uh, Mr. Reese. Thank you. Mr. Searcy, I just simply want to thank you and your team. It's been an incredible several years since I've been on the committee, and I've had the privilege of going to Polakitas. I was at the Bohatch Elementary groundbreaking or celebration last week. Tomorrow will be at O'Brien. Um, it's, it's incredible, quite frankly. And uh, although my oldest child is graduating in a few weeks, uh, and I am the product of Washoe County School District, um, it is just an honor to be a part of watching this uh, committee's work, uh, watching you specifically and your team. I know that you're very uh, loath to take credit for it, uh, but you know, someone has to be kind of the glue, and, and I think many ways that it has fallen on your shoulders. Um, I'm excited for what I see as a continued commitment to this community that will be a legacy-defining opportunity. So uh, congratulations to all of the Washoe County School District folks who work on these projects. Uh, I don't have questions, but I just want to thank you personally. Thank you. All right, Member Bidey. Um, I guess uh, the comment besides echoing what Councilman Reese just said on uh, having sat on this committee for quite a while um, and really seeing where, where we've been and where we're heading uh, and then the, the, the fruits of your labors, you know, going to those new schools and seeing the older schools and seeing what we've been able to do. And I sit on the Safe and Healthy Schools Commission also, so all of the safety enhancements and what we've done since that committee first formed six, almost seven years ago uh, has been really um, it's, it's, it's made a big difference, and I mean, that is a priority. The safety for me, for all of us, uh, is one of our top priorities. Um, and I would like to thank you because as I look at this as a fiscal conservative, and I'm looking at all of these check marks that are coming in under, you know, what the budget allocation was, and that you were able to be very mindful on the spending, and it looks like all of these really are under what we, what our original budget allocation and I know it says project is substantially complete, so there, I, I guess these could change again. But, but that you're really committed to making sure we're not going over budget, we're saving money where we can, because every, you know, basically every dollar, you know, is important to us, it's important to our taxpayers, and that's what we're here for, is to keep an eye on that, uh, not just WC1, but on the money that's being expended. And uh, I congratulate you and your staff um, for doing a good job on that, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from the members of the board? Uh, Ms. Scott, is there any public comment on this item as it is an action item? No, All right, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will entertain a motion. I'll move to approve staff recommendations. Got a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That passes unanimously. So thank you very much. That takes us on to item number three, uh, closing public comment. Uh, Ms. Scott, is there any public comment for item 3.01? I'd just like to reiterate that there was public comment Yep, and I did, I did verify I do have that in my email as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, item 3.02, uh, our next meeting will be August 5th, 2021, and we'll get some more information uh, on that coming out. Uh, with that, we'll move on to item 3.03 and adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.